Welcome to Facebook Live to Anselmo Academy of Music and the Arts to the special series we have created during COVID-19 called Music is Life, where we present uh, unique individuals, musicians, artists, performers, um, you know, educators, and composers who share with us their life story, their performances, and interesting conversations. Uh, we thank you very much all for tuning in today. My name is Vera Anselmo. I am the founder and artistic director of Anselmo Academy of Music and the Arts. And we are celebrating our 20th year anniversary this school year. We are a nonprofit organization, 501c3. And our signature programs are group classes at local schools, community center, after school programs, senior centers, and organizations that serve students with uh, you know, learning type disabilities. We provide music instructions for many, many years. And as of recently, uh, we have added additional instruments and, and programming uh, associated with that. So we moved on from just piano that we did majority of our you know, life as an organization. And we have added violin, guitar, voice, and as of recently, ukulele, saxophone, drums, musical theater, tutoring, and coming up soon, a Disney class. We have organized many online classes during this pandemic and are proud to say that we believe we bring joy and excitement to many students who want to continue their music studies. We hope you stay safe during this pandemic and enjoy our broadcast today. We have three unique guests who greatly contribute to the world of music, education, and culture. Please help me welcome Oksana Mikhailov. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Erika van der Linde Feidner. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. And Paige Roberts Malloy. Welcome, you guys. All three of you serve on the honorary board at Anselmo Academy of Music and the arts, and it's comprised of accomplished professionals in the music industry who provide moral support to our educational programs. We thank you all very much for your continued support uh, to our organization. And I will be introducing, kind of give you a brief intro to each guest unlike we did in previous programming, for those of you who are expecting certain order, it's going to be slightly different today. Um, our first guest is Oksana Mikhailov. She is a Russian-born concert pianist, a graduate from Moscow Conservatory that is known all around the world. Having performed in Russia, Europe, and US as a soloist with orchestra as, in, as in a chamber musician, and Oksana now resides in Westchester and plays a prominent role as an artist and educator. And we have a clip from Oksana's most recent recital that she recorded in February uh, with old Chopin program. And our clip is of her performing Waltz in C sharp minor. Take a listen.
Beautiful, bravo. And we get back to Oksana in just a few minutes to talk about her life and her career and all her accomplishments. Uh, let me introduce uh, to you our guest number two, Erica van der Linde Feitner. I hope I'm saying this correctly. <laughs> you can yell at me later. Um, she is born in Vermont and has a unique and diverse career from a pianist to Miss Vermont, to being featured in Seventeen magazine, to the title of best salespeople of all times and creating her own brand. We have a, have a clip from an interview that Erica had with Marcel Saviera, who is editor in chief of Brain Child magazine. Take a look. Tonight I'm delighted to have Erica Vandalinda Feidner who is a media celebrity, concert pianist, and gifted presenter. She is the founder of Piano Matchmaker. I, did. I grew up in a, in a family rich in music. Um, there were 26 pianos in my household. Um, and in the summer, there were 40 children from around the world that joined us to learn to play the piano from my family. We were all pianists and teachers. So we all began playing at the age of three. Oh. And many of us started teaching at a young age. I was nine when I started wow. teaching. Okay. And I was at the Juilliard School at 11, traveling from Vermont. Um, at the time when I was 21, 22, it was sort of, sort of a turning point in my life. I wasn't sure whether that, you know, being a pianist was going to be my path right. or not. Right. It could have been. So instead of going into the um, direction of a concert pianist, mm -hmm. I decided to encourage other people to love the piano as much as I did in my heart, but didn't want to necessarily pursue um, in the concert way. So, um, uh, thank you. So yeah. I was a teacher for many, many years, and then I later um, earned my MBA in, in marketing, just to sort of balance my education, mm -hmm. and then um, went into the piano business, and that was really my home. And I, yeah. I took about a 30-year break <laughs> until <laughs> Until about two years ago, when uh, it was still a major part of my life, but I right. just wasn't performing. Right. And about two years ago, I was approached by a, a wonderful group to do a concert to benefit um, something called Stop Hunger Now. Okay. And we oh. were able to um, uh, come up with a, a, a substantial um, amount of money to support children. And I said, what's a piano matchmaker? <laughs> so I said, well, you'll find out on the show. Erica will tell us. It's so, a really good question. And um, it's a really good name. So what do you do as a, a piano you. matchmaker? Um, as the piano matchmaker, um, what I do is I pair people to pianos and pianos to people. Um, what's exceptional about what I do is each piano, even if we had 100 of them all lined up with the same birthday, the same size, the same price, the same, this, that, and the other. Each one is unique because they're made of organic materials. So my job is to get to know the needs of the client or the family mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. find the perfect fit of a piano that might meet their needs. Now, what does that mean? That means, well, well maybe somebody's 92 and they just want to play um, cocktail music in the corner quietly for the rest of their lives and, and they know that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so we'll choose a piano that has a lyrical, sort of shy, uh, warm sound. Whereas if it's for a family, mm -hmm. we don't know whether Joey, who's three, is going to play classical or rock or whatever. Right. So we'll, we'll choose a piano that has um, enormous range and dynamic and color and tonal qualities and is happy and peppy but can also be lyrical and quiet and, and, and all that. So um, that's, that's what I do. But be, even beyond that, what I try to do once we find the perfect piano is often parents choose a piano for their child. Right. And what I want so much to do and my life's passion is to transcend the love of music and piano, not just to the children. Often parents have sort of a secret desire to want to like play that. also. Right. So one of the things I do is I happen to have a patented method of reading music and playing the piano in one lesson, and I share that with folks, and I get the whole family playing. So it's um, it's not about buying a piano. That has, it's, it's, that's not it at all. It's, it's really the whole experience of 
the um, adventure in recognizing that every piano is unique and which one is the right one and mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I do and it's, it's very satisfying and really gratifying and something that is um, unlike anything that I've sort of known in my own life and it's, yeah. I'm just very happy. Fantastic. Thank you, Erica. And we'll get back to Erica um, uh, soon after uh, we present other um, musicians. Our guest number three is Paige Roberts Malloy, who was born in Texas. She became a concert artist at a very young age, performing as a teenager with uh, orchestras and having studied with legendary artists and establishing collaborations uh, as a chamber musician in her current city of Seattle. Paige been described by New York Times as a lucid and passionate performer. We made a video clip featuring Paige's photographs as she uh, performing Brahms Quintet and F minor. Take a listen. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Paige. So we go back now to our guest number one, Oksana Mihailov. And let me give a little bit more detail before we start with your biography. As I mentioned, you are a Russian-born concert artist. You've performed in Europe and United States, um, uh, in Russia as well. And you had your debut at Carnegie Hall in 1999. And as the second prize winner at Martha Argerich competition in 2003, you perform in the famous opera house, Teatro Colón uh, in Buenos Aires. 
uh, which I happen to be in, uh, at when I been to Argentina. Um, you are a dedicated uh, teacher. You've created your own organization called Homeschool Conservatory, which you'll tell us more about. And you also created a concert series called Midland Music Concert Series in Bronxville. And in partnership with Vasily Primakov, who is another well-known concert artist, you run Sparkle Concert Series in also Westchester, New York. Um, Aksana, now it's your turn. Enough of me talking. I'll zip my mouth. So tell us about your growing up in Russia and your first steps in your music education. Sure. Um, I come from a family of professional musicians. Both of my parents are pianists, but my grandparents none of them played piano. I think it's just, it happened to be that my mom met my dad uh, when they were studying in uh, um, college. And um, my mom was very young when I was born. She was 21, 22, and she was in college when I was born. So my earliest memories um, of me sitting under the piano, somehow I felt like the sound was better uh, and I could hear the most there. And I was just fascinated by her playing. My dad was not home, he was teaching more. So my mom spent more time with me, but I never, people ask me often, like, when did you know you, you wanna be a pianist? I always knew that. It was never like a decision that I had to sit down and think about. It was just natural, process. My mom was my first teacher. I didn't start very early. I didn't start at three. I started maybe five, five and a half, close to six. And my mom taught me first um, maybe year and a half to two years. But according to her, I was not listening very well. And so she found another teacher who taught me, I was born, I should say this too, I was born not in Moscow, I was born in a small town near Moscow. So up to uh, my age of eight, I lived with my parents. And there I went to a regular music school. But when I was eight years old, I went to a first international competition in Czechoslovakia. And I got a third place and the special prize for being the youngest contestant. And after that, after winning this competition, the decision was made for me to go to Central Music School in Moscow. So from that point, from my being eight, I lived in Moscow. So I feel like I'm from Moscow, but I wasn't born there. But um, oh, my, my second, whole, yeah. One second, we want to show some pictures. Uh, oh, sure. Can we please show her some pictures of Oksana as a child first? <laughs> ah, here you are with a with a toy dog. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And here you are cleaning the street. Right. There was uh, my parents uh, uh, had to. I guess it was some kind of like May first, and and all the students had to uh, come to college where they studied and help cleaning. And I was already active participant then. Mm -hmm. And then we have pictures of you. I would like to show one second where you are um, with um, other students. You are uh, in Germany mm -hmm. in 1988 and you are hugging. Yes. And, yes. Yes. And, and still is right behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Vasily Primakov is right here, all the way to the left. He was what, 11? He was 11, yes. 11. So this is, was, class of, was this is a class of Vera uh, Gornostaya. Yes. OK, Correct. great. And then we also have a picture of you, might as well show it now, at Leeds competition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And you mm -hmm. are um, with Natalia Lavrova, who was also featured on this broadcast in previous months. Um, okay, wonderful. So we go back now. Uh, let me just make sure I didn't forget anything as far as pictures at this time. Um, yes, I think we are good to go. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, please tell us about your first teachers as a, at the special music school. Go ahead. So my my first teacher, I was I was very very lucky when I went to Central Music School um, at the age of eight. I studied with a person named Anaida Sumbatian, and she, uh, together with four more women of her age, she was close to being 80 at the time, they were founders of Central Music School. So basically that was like the best best teacher I could be with. I got lucky and I studied with her until I was 11. She passed away when I was 11. And after that, I went to Bernastaeva's class and studied with her um, up until I was 19, 20. And then I had another teacher, Vladimir Krainev, who also in his time was a student of Sumba Town. So that connection was, uh, since I was a kid, he knew me. I couldn't study with him because he did not teach. He was just a performing artist. And when I was 19, 20, he started teaching a master conservatory. So I uh, changed from Granastaeva to him and, and studied with him. And I was with him up until I left Russia. He actually okay. left Russia as well. And Yes, if I may interrupt, all I, I just wanted to say for those who don't know, not everybody is Russian, uh, listening to this broadcast, Anaida Sumbachan is a, is a renowned uh, teacher who taught so many le legendary artists. Uh, you mentioned it in your biography. She taught Ashkenazi and she taught Aksana Yablonska, many, many, like an army of performing artists. And then Vera Garnastaeva, um, she she didn't teach very young children. Is that right? She taught. More That's older. right. She did that. Yeah. She did that. She, she taught, taught older. older and Vestili and this uh, this uh, other girl that was featured in the photo. They were just two youngest people she ever took. And normally her students would be from you know 15, 16, and and up to. Mm -hmm. whenever they That's graduate right. from us yeah from conservatory or doctor program or whatever up, up until they do you know don't study with her anymore but young children that was not her like she did not take mm -hmm. but these two teachers who are no longer alive they went down in history as one of the best known in Russia's history. So that just so to clarify it for our broad audience. Um, let's move on. And so you met Vasily. I only want to bring him into your story because you currently run a concert series where he also participates in organizing and performing. So I want to kind of bring him into the story. We also have a picture of you with Vasily at Van Cliburn competition. What year was that? Can we share that? picture? I don't know. I'm so bad with years. I, I would say 2003, 2004, something like that. No, that's not it. That's not it. With Vasily. No, that's yes. No, no, that's not. That's more modern. That's not. Yes. There is a picture somewhere we have, Jude, of no, that's not, that's not my <laughs> for sure. That's not it was a picture sure. where they are, I think, uh, giving an interview. Yes, maybe, yes. Maybe you look for it and you let us know when you when you can show it. We can move on with the story. The pictures that were just shown, you were with Vladimir Krainev. Uh, who was your teacher, as you mentioned, who also studied with Sumbatan. Can we bring that back again? Jude, sorry to probably mess you up right now. Yes, yeah, that's so, mm -hmm. he was also a very well known concert performer and you studied with him at Moscow Conservatory. Correct. Okay, and then we also have a picture of uh, you with Mr. Krainev and Oksana Yablonska who is hidden right now at the moment, or maybe it's a different picture. Can we show- No, no there's, there's Oksana. Oh, you see her on my screen, I don't. Yes. Yes, I, we see, I see. Uh, yeah, that's the photo with Krainev and Yablonska. Okay, very good. And that was at Leeds? Mm -hmm. Okay, very Correct. good. Um, so when we find, uh, no, that's not the Vasily picture. Maybe you don't have it. It that's is Vasily, it is Vasily, but it's now. It's not the, this the, the picture we're talking about, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, anything you'd like to add 
to your growing up in Russia? What age did you leave? I left Russia when I was 25, right um, after I graduated. And uh, uh, what I wanted to add actually is this, um, older I get, more important and more I think about my upbringing and my schooling. And of course, being a teacher, I am who I am only because I was there and, and people that I studied with. It's just, I, I, I find when I play, I, I see influence, I see you know ideas or something that I played back then and I'm bringing back. I, you know, I, I am who I am because of my school, my family, because of my family, because of my school, they formed me completely. I, I don't know what I would be if I was in a different place. Well, it's also, I think, good to say, since I also am from Moscow, uh, is that it's a very strong tradition. It's, uh, you know, they train you for life, like a soldier, really, literally. Um, <laughs> yes, so what, sure. what, made you, what made you leave? What made you come to New That is an interesting uh, question, because I, I feel like that was also, I always knew that I will leave because my mom talked to me about that when I was little. I think my mom wanted to leave. My, my parents wanted to immigrate, but somehow they couldn't. They didn't, just didn't work out or they, as, as they say, maybe we were not brave enough, but I kind of knew that once I finish Moscow Conservatory, I will go somewhere. Where would it be? That was a question because nobody said, oh, you're gonna go to New York and no, not like that. But the fact that I would leave Russia, it was, clear to me since I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. um, although I did not speak any English when I came here. First time I went to Germany, I, I wanted to see how I feel, you know, living there, but that I didn't feel at home. And then I came to New York and the moment I landed, literally at the airport, I knew that that is my home. That was just like from love from the first Amazing. breath of air. Mm -hmm. and, and However difficult it was without the, you know, without anybody, I was by myself. I didn't have any money and I didn't speak the language. No, nothing fazed me. I knew that I would be okay. And so let's move on to your Carnegie Hall debut. And then after that, you know, the well- Yeah, I did, I did bunch of, uh, bunch of competitions. First, when I came, I, I did not go to school right away. I actually worked, uh, I, I was an accompanist at uh, Manus. Uh, I met my husband quickly after like a year and a half after I came to America and he's American. So that of course helped me in, in every way and English and just life in general. And it was a beautiful story and continues to be after 20 some years. Um, and then also um, just um, being in touch with people that I know, like Vasily's connection is, is crucial because what I do now, uh, it's just friendship with him really that started uh, ideas of you know running concert series, of playing together. That's, we, we're currently uh, working on new programs. So it's just all kind of, falls in the right place, but uh, by ourselves, by myself, I, I wouldn't be able to do any of what I have now. And um, I do run two concert series and I also have a music school right now that I love very much. And the idea is providing music lessons at people people's homes. That's why it's homeschool music research because myself and my teachers, we go to people's homes to, to teach them one-on-one. -on -one. And um, I'm proud of it because again, of the teachers that work for me, Vasily is one of them, but I have, you know, violin, mm -hmm. guitar te teacher, cello teacher, voice teacher, music theory teacher. So I'm trying to uh, create something what I came out of, right? And, and pass it on. Fantastic. Did you want to say anything about your Carnegie Hall debut? Uh, I oh, I it was a, it was just yeah. a result of a competition that I won. I, I played the one concert uh, that was the debut and that opened doors to, to other concerts. I came back, I played at Carnegie Hall again on uh, Chopin's uh, anniversary of his death, 150th, 150th, right? Is it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm so bad with years, yes. Yeah. yeah um, 
yeah, it's as any concert is important concert. Every next concert is important concert. That's how I look at that and doesn't matter about, if it's a Carnegie Hall. Martha Argerich, Martha Argerich competition. That was experience not to be forgotten because it, it was wonderful. Uh, it was a competition that I was fortunate to get second place. And after that, we uh, had a month long tour and she was with the prize winners and she played and we played. And it was just an amazing time to, to just be near her and see her work her magic. Wonderful. And so uh, tell us a little bit about your partnership with Vasily, because we have a, a video that we'd like to play of you playing on two pianos, Rachmaninoff Suite. But tell us a little bit about your concert series. Um, so we, we have together, we run Sparkle concert series. Uh, Currently, of course, we're not able to do live concerts, but we are uh, still trying to provide our audience with some events. So, so far we were just, we're able to record. We did one program with Vasily, one, one piano, four hands. We recorded in the location and then we stream it or just, you know, put it on YouTube for people to watch. Uh, then we did, each of us did a solo concert. I did old Chopin uh, program and he did old Schumann program. And currently it's available on, on YouTube as well. And then the next concert, we're trying to do two piano concert, although the location doesn't have the second piano. So what we are um, looking for, you know, opportunity where we can just go and record somewhere else where two pianos are already in, in one room. And we, we have some ideas in mind and still it's with the goal to provide that to our Sparkle audience and of course wider audience if someone else wants to watch it. But uh, it's been a great experience working with Vasily because we, I guess, partially because we come from the same school and the same teacher and we know each other for so many years. It's just more than friends, it's practically like family and we see things in a very similar way. So we, uh, in the better times pre-COVID, when we would invite artists, we would always find, you know, who would be next playing and we mm -hmm. look at things similarly. So it's been just enormous joy for me to, Great. to do it with him. We can now show pictures uh, that mm -hmm. you showed before with Vasily playing and then at the piano bowing, I guess. That was a moment of bowing. Yeah, it was after. No, not this one. Not this one. Yes. Yeah. Okay, here you are. Uh, is that Sparkle? Yes, this is Sparkle. Yes, Sparkle concert. Um, it's a beautiful venue. I've been there. They're very, very nice. So that's, I guess, it's after performance. And then we have another picture of you actually playing. Yes, Vasily yes. is hidden behind you. Great, excellent. And so we can now also play the Rachmaninoff Suite, please, that we have.
fantastic. And so, Oksana, tell us a little bit more about your, um, I guess maybe more about teaching your personal students, your, your dedicated teacher yourself, um, anything you'd like to share, like, you know, that you'd like to inspire your, your students, just like your teachers inspired you. Anything about teaching? Sure, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit different. I can compare it to, you know, if I lived in Russia, I maybe, uh, you know, taught at Central Music School, probably the goals would be different. But here, uh, my most important goal is not necessarily to make concert pianists out of them, but to make sure that they have the love for music, for piano, for music in general, and that they know how to express themselves right i i can count on probably fingers on one hand how many students over the years actually went uh, you know into music as business or studied in college most of them don't choose to do that but they all love they basically i know that they would go to concerts in the future i know that they, the music will be part of their lives and that what inspires me and that's what gives me joy to to see how you know they come because their parents wanted them to take lessons and how they it's as teenagers how they can't wait for their piano lesson because they love it themselves right so that's the 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 biggest goal and the reward for me is enormous and an example would be now during pandemic i did not lose single student because they didn't want to stop that however they're not crazy about online of course you can compare online lessons to you know hands-on sitting next to a person but they all continued some doubled up lessons because they had more time that's only because they want to do it themselves and that's what makes me really happy and excited for them and i know that i do something that will have an impact longer lasting impact on their lives fantastic that was beautiful and can we close uh Aksana's interview with her performing uh clips of um chopin ballad number no. four
Thank you so much, Aksana. Can we uh, finish the broadcast with Aksana by showing her professional picture that we have in a red dress? Yes, beautiful. Thank you so much, Aksana, for participating. It was an honor. And we are moving on to our guest number two, Erica van der Linde Feintner. Am I saying it right? You can correct me. I've gone back and forth from Erica van der Linde Feintner to just Erica Feintner, and either works, and your pronunciation was perfect. Excellent. So you're not going to hit me later. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Erica has a very unique uh, career, very diversified career. She grew up in Vermont, uh, where she, uh, she mentioned in her earlier interview that we had a clip of in a professional music family. She uh, been, you know, uh, sort of put into the atmosphere of, of music since very, very young age. She became a pianist, um, educator, and then you moved on to Miss Vermont and then to MBA uh, in sales and marketing, very contrasting. And uh, you've been fe featured in multiple magazines like Forbes, uh, New Yorker, Inc. Magazine, and on various TV shows portraying you as one of the best sales people of all times. And you have also created your own brand in 2005 that you called Piano Matchmaker. And um, you can tell us about it in just a little bit. But you also have other inventions that I encourage you to, to share with us. So let's start from the beginning your childhood, your family, musicians, your life in Vermont, all of that. Go ahead. Sure, so childhood, my childhood was extraordinary and colorful, I'll put it that way. <laughs> it was just an amazing experience. We were, um, I'm from a family of seven pianists and educators. And so, um, Every summer when I was young, there would be 40, as you know, 40 children from around the world that would come to our house and live with us from two to six weeks to learn to play the piano. Certainly that was the focus, but also they, you know, the children and we as the, the faculty members learn many, many skills, including um, how to manage your time and, um, cooking and arts and crafts and, and, and working with people and, and teamwork, just many, many uh, wonderful um, aspects of, of that experience. Uh, so, you know, as an individual that was fortunately part of this and PS, it's still ongoing, it's been 52 years and it's still ongoing, so our son Tina. So um, it was, an amazing training ground for me for life because I was certainly a founding member, if you want to say that, I was very young, and a faculty member and a teacher when I was nine, as you know, and also a student and a friend. Mm -hmm. And the head of arts and crafts, like mm -hmm. extraordinary. It was just sort of an opportunity. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to do something, you just go and do it with the children. Or if you're given an assignment and you have no idea how to do it, jump in and do it anyway. And that actually relates to something that you just said that I didn't quite realize in my own life, which is the diversity. Mm -hmm. and I think that is in large part from growing up with, with wonderful parents uh, who were certainly uh, very supportive. Uh, it's just th this idea that you can do anything you want. And you, you, there are many aspects of my life that seem not to be related, but that's because I, I tend to think that if I have um, a situation where um, part of my education is missing, you know, so PS, I, I got my MBA, I needed a piano. So PS, I went in the Miss America pageant. <laughs> to, you know, hopefully earn some, some scholarship money to buy my first Steinway. And then to- That's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. 
that's why I did it. And by the way, it continues to be the um, largest scholarship organization in the United States for to this day. Fantastic. Take a quick break. We want to show some pictures of your childhood and also the famous house in Vermont that still exists and, and you, your family runs the, the camp in that house. Can we show those pictures, please? Mm hmm Lovely. <laughs> Fun. And so that's your pre-college Juilliard ID. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> You'll tell us more about it uh, as I think it's very interesting that you have traveled on your own from Vermont to Juilliard. And a picture of the house. Can we see the house? Yes, I love it. <laughs> it's nice. It, it's a, I mean, like I mentioned, we were very rich in music and it, it seems like, well, maybe we were rich period financially, um, but that wasn't what life was about at all. And, and frankly, no, we were not wealthy at all. Um, that was another thing that was instilled in us, which is if you have a, a, a dream, if you have a goal, something you want to do in your life, you just go and figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to add, because you talked to me about it in private. so. Your family runs a Sanatina camp, right, in this house. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, we talked about a little bit, and, and children or and adults don't just come and play, they stay. So it really is a camp camp. They come and stay, you provide accommodations, you provide <laughs> meals, which is incredible. And I think you said it, it's kind of like a nest for piano and music enthusiasts, which is beautiful. Um, and it can, how many years has, has this been going, this camp? Well, thank you so much. The, um, the idea of the family behind it, yes, we were all seven of us were founding members. Uh, and then, um, gosh, a couple of decades ago, my eldest sister, Polly Vandalinda, took over at the school. And she has expanded it and enriched it. And she's just, she's just amazing. So she, she was really um, the, uh, the one who encouraged um, the 10 day programs for adults, where again, adults from around the world descend upon the house <laughs> for 10 days. Um, and there are 10 sessions every year for that. And I believe they also have something called the, the that's called the Sonata. In the summer for the children, Sonatina. So Sonata and, Camp and Sonatina Camp. Yes. And okay. then she developed the Intermezzo, which is like a Friday to Monday family oriented type thing. So, so yes, growing up in this, this house, yes, it was a camp. It was really a, a home. A yeah. home that was warm and all about music and all about being supportive and just the joy of life. I don't know. <laughs> and, and so then you received a full scholarship to go to Juilliard Preparatory Division. Yeah. And you told me uh, that you travel on your own from Vermont, which is what, four hours? Is it something like that? Like that does. <laughs> yes. To Juilliard on your own. How old were you? Um, well, I went to Juilliard uh, with my sister Polly the first year, and then thereafter, yes, I, I was allowed to skip school every Friday, and then at 2.10, I would get on the bus to uh, Port Authority in 1976. Oh, which, my goodness. Yeah. But, mm -hmm, and so you were a teenager, and so you stayed on your own somewhere in the city, and I, then... Yeah, sorry, I was fortunate to, to have relatives where I would stay overnight and then, you know, bright and early on Saturday morning would go to Juilliard, uh, right up the block up here <laughs> yeah. and have classes all day. And then, um, uh, and chorus and solfege, the whole thing it was just an amazing experience with other very talented, uh, people, children. Mm -hmm. And then I would take the, um, the bus home and get home around 11, 1130 at night. And I did that every week for four years. That is incredible commitment as a teenager. Fantastic. And so as a young adult, you um, went on to receive a bachelor in piano performance. Uh, you were also a scholarship student at SUNY Purchase. 
Uh, you've performed with uh, uh, Albany Symphony Orchestra, Vermont Orchestra as well. And so tell us about your um, Miss Vermont pageant <laughs> and also Seventeen Magazine. How we understand now Miss Vermont was you wanted to buy a piano, which is phenomenal story. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so it was certainly about buying a piano, but it was also an opportunity to bring music to people in the state who, you know, way up north in, in, in Vermont, there was a town called Enosburg Farms. And my guess is, you know, they weren't, ex people there weren't exposed to as much classical music as, as others. And to bring that to people in a small town, in a hog farm, on a little vertical piano next to the porta potties in the rain was an, ex <laughs> was really an amazing experience, certainly for me, but also I, I hope that um, others enjoyed it as well. So I think I've always been about um, spreading and inspiring the joy of music. And so the Miss Vermont, um, uh, which led to the Miss America pageant, of course, a few months later in Atlantic City, um, was, Something that <laughs> um, I'm not a pageant girl necessarily, uh, but it was a, again, a wonderful experience where uh, I was performing and speaking to audiences and, um, and then the Miss America pageant. I mean, that interview that we all, all 50 of us had was really something. Like the, the women that were involved with Miss America, very bright women, bright, Educated, um, just um, just a wonderful um, group of, of women, uh, and I will never forget it. And so I was very, very honored to be part of that. Great, and and it probably helped you build your, you know, not only self esteem but also takes away being a musician, take away something about you know education and well being and sharing your you know, love and commitment with younger yeah. generation. Right on. I mean, uh, again, I learned to just jump in and tackle something that you might not be fair, um, familiar with. And so the idea of um, what you were just talking about was totally foreign to me. <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing, but the benefit was, was enormous. I mean, it just really helped in my career later on in presenting performances of either whether children or stunning artists or, or whatever it was. And then um, certainly in just in many, many aspects of my life, so. Wonderful. And so you already mentioned it in your interview uh, that we had watched earlier about turning point in your life where you decided MBA in marketing was something you wanted to explore. Tell us more about that. Sure. So um, when I was, I, I'm not really athletically coordinated, <laughs> but I thought, okay, I'll, I'm from Vermont, but I really haven't been skiing, so I'll give that a go. And so I remember I purposely had three layers of mittens on because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to, I knew I was going to fall, right? So I wore mittens instead of gloves. And so the only finger, of course, that was sort of on its own was my thumb. So I remember falling and I fell like this. Let's see, there we go. So, you know, my, my thumb was really kind of hurting. And then of course I fell again in the exactly the same way. And I went to um, the, the emergency area, the, the, the ski lodge and so on. And I wound up having a torn ligament in my thumb, which, you know, they certainly put a, a cast on my, my hand uh, and my arm and for the first time, I could not play the piano. And at first I was thinking, you know, within seconds thinking, oh no, all I know right now is the world of piano. All I know how to do is play the piano. That's how I felt. And then I thought, actually, I don't have to be a pianist if I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And so that led to um, getting my MBA, uh, which was probably the, the the biggest challenge in my life. It was just so foreign to me and so challenging. Um, but, you know, I did it. And I, I, I sort of count that as one of the um, most important parts of my life was, was going and doing that and actually doing it and finishing it. 
So wonderful. And so you uh, let me just speed up just a little bit. But so you ended up uh, working at, at various, uh, uh, you know, sales positions until you ended up at 1992 at Steinway on 57th Street that we all know very well. And you stayed there from 1992 to 2005. Can we show that picture of Erica with Henry Steinway? Yes, right here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. an amazing mm -hmm. food from, from time to time. And I mean, there were times where he would, you know, when requested, come down and sign the plate of a piano that was recently going home, AKA selected, AKA purchased. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes inscribe a personal note to the family it just it just enhanced the whole experience in selecting a piano and uh yeah what an amazing man so, yes and so i have a question for you so um you seem to be very intuitive in your sales you rise to the top and been featured, uh, we're gonna show the articles, you were on the cover of, uh, uh, was it Inc. Magazine, I believe, uh, as you know, top sales people of all times. Um, so what do you think is, is, you know, here you are as a Vermont music student coming to Juilliard on Saturdays, and then you're becoming top sales representative at Steinway & Sons. Um, how do you think that you end up being so good at that? And what motivated you? Um, this might sound ridiculous, but I ask, <laughs> ask myself that every single day. I, I just, my, my life has been touched with uh, just gold, gold plate or 21 carat or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I've been very, very fortunate in my life. And I think on top of that, um, I like to think that I have been very prepared. Um, I think um, luck comes to the prepared man. I like to think that. Um, but also having grown up uh, encircled by the idea that um, if there's something that you might want to do or something that you can create in the world that's new or what have you, then go and do it and figure, figure out how to do it. And in the meantime, I have fun doing it. So um, I'm just, I don't know, just a, a big believer that music and business and, and life can be fun mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Can we show some of the uh, pictures we have from New Yorker? Oh, yes. And then Ink Magazine. Thank you. So um, may I speak when the, the um, photos are coming up? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. So this this just <laughs> came out of out of nowhere. So Ink Magazine, I was um, very happy to be on the on the cover with an inside feature story. And then in 2011, Ink.com called on fr a Friday afternoon, and, <laughs> and they said, "Hey, can you send us a photograph?" You know, and I said. Yeah, I was on the cover, but you know, I can. And I, at the end, I said, you know, may I ask what this is about? And they said, we're doing a little sales piece. And Monday morning, I went online and saw this, where I was named one of 10 greatest salespeople of all time, along with David Ogilvy and, and Larry Ellison. And just- Amazing. Amazing thing. Yeah, so I've, I've been very, less and very fortunate. Uh, and um, that came after another extraordinary happening in my life, which was in 2001, um, a, a client with whom I had helped find his piano, um, James B. Stewart, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, about, you know, shortly after he purchased a piano with me, said, you know, actually, I'd like to do a story about you know what you do because it's you know it's interesting and people might not know about it and 
and all that. So it wound up being a very long story in the New Yorker. And with his writing, uh, it was just, it, it was um, up for the National Magazine Award and, and so on. And it just, just, uh, he really got the element of what it is that I, that I tried to do. Mm. And so then there was a period, period in my life, probably after 2003, uh, where I just couldn't catch a break. I had one illness after another until fairly recently, just, just a hard time. And that, that happens, right? Mm. About two and a half years ago, I got, I got an email from Jim Stewart and he said, there's been a miracle. <laughs> what are you talking about? So it turns out that Tessa Ross was the, uh, is the executive producer of films like Slumdog Millionaire and 12 Years a Slave and Billy Elliot and The Iron Lady and like 50 other films. She's in, um, in London. Um, she bought the rights to the story and wanted to do a feature film. And you know, the mortality rate is very high for these kinds of things, right? But um, I heard from her recently. She's just wonderful to stay in touch. And she, she mentioned that the screenplay um, should be ready by the end of the summer. Um, and we still have a ways to go, but how did this happen? That is really, really great. Tell us about your, um, your uh, own you know, brand that you created called Piano Matchmaker. Yeah, thank you. So um, when I was speaking with Mr. Stewart uh, about the New Yorker story, it just sort of came about that I said that I was like a piano matchmaker. And I had mentioned that to clients, that sort of thing. But it was, you know, being in sales, being in business, um, you know, uh, you sort of think about what is it that made me successful? And what I really believe is that I was in a, in a small niche, first of all, being a pianist, but also a salesperson, right? And then, you know, it, it's like being a niche, in a niche of a niche of a niche where you can shine. Mm -hmm. And that led to my success. Mm -hmm. That's really what I believe. So you really like a matryoshka? Oh. <laughs> I, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Uh, great. Uh, let's move on to the other video that we have of your interview uh, for a TV uh, documentary, TV show. Now, I've heard this. I, I, <laughs> you're famous for being able to instantly predict which piano yeah. they're going to end up choosing. That's right. Let, let's, let's start at the reading process because mm -hmm. this is fascinating. So somebody walks in. Let's say it's you. Let's say it's me. Mm -hmm. What are you reading? You know, I, you say hello, I say hello. Mm -hmm. I say I'm looking for a piano. Mm -hmm. What are you reading? I'm reading body language. Your arms are like this. You, you look confident. You look interested. Mm. Um, so it's, it's difficult to... To describe truly, um, I listen to the tone of their voice, the speed of their voice, mm. eye contact or not, um, because that gives me an idea of. Um, I can often predict what line of business they are in, okay. and that way, once I figure that out, I can speak in a language that they understand best. What's an example? You might speak A versus B. Right. Let's say there's an engineer. Mm. They're going to want to know everything about the building and the and the the. the manufacturer of different brands versus a pianist is really there for a piano that's that they're looking for sound and touch ah. so it's a very very different experience i see so you're versatile enough to be able to speak in different languages yes. for the right audience yes I've done it all my life because i've been around people all my life you ever get it wrong like maybe you read me as an engineer mm -hmm. and we start going down this path and then i'm just like mm, you know i don't it's not resonating with me well, can I'll, you tell I'll, oh sure Sure, and again, it's the body language. Um, people, for whatever reason, tend to be very open with mm -hmm. me um, right from the get-go. And maybe it's the greeting, maybe it's the showroom, I'm not sure. But we try to make it a very pleasant, positive experience. And so um, often people will say, you know, I don't know anything about pianos. And my response is, you want to be careful who you say that to. Because the piano business is not regulated. And a lot of people take advantage of clients who don't know a lot about pianos. So please be cautious. And that gives them an idea like, well, why would this person be saying that? Right. But it builds credibility and loyalty by planting those seeds of doubt. I like that. You're also putting them under your protection. Yes. That's very important. It's so very important. You're not just... I, I don't think about selling at all. 
I, oh, really? You know, as they walk in, um, in my mind, I go through the inventory because I know the sound, touch, and serial number of every single piano in the building, mm -hmm. and also in White Plains. And I just get a read, like if there were a woman who was maybe 55 and she's always wanted a piano and her husband's with her and she plays cocktail music. Okay, well, she might want to play classical, so we need to keep that door open to choose mm. a piano that can do anything. But if she's certain that she wants to play only cocktail music for the rest of her life, then we'll choose a piano that's very lovely, very lyrical, that doesn't have a lot of fire. And um, also when they're at the piano, I look at their body language there too, mm. make sure their shoulders are relaxed, that their fingers are comfortable, and I just get a quick read within seconds. Often people will say, I, I'm so grateful we came in today and met you because you're the perfect person in the perfect place. Mm. And they had no idea what they were getting into when they walked in the door. I love it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, would you like to share anything else? I know you have other inventions and, and you you just really like a, a nonstop uh, entrepreneur. Uh, yes, tell, tell us more about your, your patent. Thank you. So um, I remember working with clients and they would say, okay, I have $80,000. I understand what this piano has to offer for me and my family. I understand, you know, the value of X, Y, and Z, but I'm really embarrassed. I don't want to spend $80,000 on a piano when my daughter is only eight years old and I don't know how to play. So I started thinking about that for a while. <laughs> I thought, I need to find out how I can show people that they can read music and play the piano right away. So when I was not feeling so well for so many years in bed, I came up with um, what is behind my first patent, which is how to read music and play the piano in one lesson. <laughs> and it, it's just like, okay, well, I don't want to buy this piano because I, I don't know how to read and play. Okay, well, let me show you over here. And then the piano goes home every time. So and again, it's not about sales. It's not. It's about um, just about an, an experience for somebody and who, who didn't really know what they were getting into. And, it's, and I just want to say that that's a huge risk. When you're in sales, you don't bring about problems on purpose. <laughs> but I would bring up things that the client didn't know that would complicate things. But in the end, once they understood what goes into choosing a piano and how wonderful it can be and how it can affect all aspects of your life. That's what I like to do. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for participating. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you so much. We are moving on to our last but not least, guest number three, Paige Roberts Malloy. Uh, just a few words about your accomplishments. Um, you have been a concert pianist since very young age, uh, performing with orchestra in US and Europe. You perform at Weill Hall, Alistali Hall, among other well-known venues. And you've participated at multiple music festivals like Tanglewood, Aspen, and Marlboro. Your teachers, just like Oksana's, are some of the most distinguished musicians this world has ever known in the United States, like Peter Serkin, Leon Fleischer, and Maurizio Pellini, and Abby Simon. Uh, and currently you collaborate, um, you live in Seattle, and you collaborate with Seattle Chamber Music Festival, and you also create partnerships with the members of the, of the orchestra. Uh, so we would like to hear your story, your childhood, uh, were your family members musicians? How did you begin your journey? Hi, everybody. Um, wow, I've got, a, I've got two tough acts to follow here. <laughs> right. Um, thanks so much for having me. What a privilege and what, what a, an enjoyment, too, to hear um, Oksana and Erica's, uh, you know, kind of uh, life story of music. Um, mine is quite different. Um, I did not grow up in a family of musicians. Um, I'm from a small town in East Texas, Tyler, Texas. And uh, my parents, um, neither one uh, was a musician, but my mom's mom uh, was the church organist at her Baptist church. 
and she had an old upright in her house. And um, my parents, let's see, I think my mom was 19 when she had me. So my parents were kids. Um, my dad at the time was a mechanic, a car mechanic at his dad's gas station. And um, my grandmother took care of me a lot. Um, I was the first grandchild of the family. And uh, so I spent a lot of time at her house. Um, a lot of music was on, a lot of old timey TV shows were on with, you know, they all had great music and the radio was always playing and she would sit at her piano at night and play show tunes and Gershwin and some Baptist hymns and all kinds of things. No classical music. I was not at all introduced to classical music in my earliest years, but, um, I loved it. I loved hearing piano. And, um, I think probably the first time anybody thought that I might've had a shred of talent was I sat down at the piano and I picked out the tune of Lynn Campbell's rhinestone cowboy. Cause I had heard it on the radio <laughs> and I, I was probably about three or four years old. And I also could sing every single song. I had a little 45 record player. And so I knew all the Jackson five hits. I knew the Carly Simon tunes and I could sing, you know, I had really good pitch. And so my parents realized that I was musical. Um, in kindergarten, the music teacher at my little elementary school um, told my parents that definitely this little girl needs to take piano lessons. So, you know, luck would have it. I found the best piano teacher in my little town of Tyler, Texas, and uh, started my classical music journey at the age of about five. Hold on just a sec, we wanna show some pictures. Okay. Uh, can we see some pictures of pages, um, uh, you know, as a child growing up with her family? You can go ahead and tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so to the uh, to my left uh, on the camera, though, to the right is my grandmother who was the pianist. And then directly over my right shoulder is her mother, who at the time was, oh gosh, she was oh, probably gosh. about 98. And then that's my mom, the young, beautiful gal to my direct left. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was just after my very first little solo piano recital at my piano teacher's house. And I think I was eight or nine years old. Great. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's, your... my, that's my grandmother who I called Denny. Uh, obviously she was in her youth there long before I was even thought of. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was, you know, my first inspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's you, of course. Yes, with the with the dreaded metronome there that I think at one point in my teen years, I took the metronome and hucked it out the window. <laughs> and there's my mom. This was at another um, piano recital in Houston um, where I had the privilege to play a few piano recitals there because um, what happened in high school is my parents started to take me to Houston for piano lessons. And that's where I studied with Abby Simon and also Mary Norris, who was on faculty at Rice University. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, just a random, random picture. New York City, New York City pick, New York two York. girls having fun in New York City. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, good grief. Not at the piano, right? <laughs> Might as well be on a potty. Oh my gosh. Well, I was clearly a ham. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. So please tell us, um, tell us more about you. You know, when you became a teenager, you already won a competition and you played Beethoven concerto. So how did you get from very beginning to that level? Well, so, you know, it pretty early on, like eight, nine, 10, 11 years, I started kind of winning all of the state competitions in Texas. I became a pretty big fish in a small pond, mm -hmm. <laughs> although not, not to say Texas isn't loaded with lots of talent, but um, I won a lot of competitions. The first 
concerto I played was at Baylor University, and that was um, the prize. After winning first prize in a concerto competition, I played Beethoven first piano concerto. Um, I remember I had two concerts. Um, one was a children's concert and one was later on. And in the children's concert, I was so nervous that the very opening of the concerto, you know, I mean, literally the first measure, I was almost paralyzed and I kind of had a memory slip and I came in a little late and luckily I had a second chance later that evening <laughs> that it didn't happen. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I started going to music festivals um, at the age of 13. I spent my uh, first four summers, um, 1983, 84, 85, 86, at Aspen Music Festival. Um, how, did you, how did you come about that? Well, was it so, teachers? Mm -hmm. so my, my dad um, was at that time in the oil business, and he was on the road doing oil work and was in a bar one night and struck up a conversation with a very interesting little guy um, that happened to be Abby Simon. That is an amazing this was, story. This was down in Houston. And he said, you know, in his Texas accent with his big mustache, he said, my little girl's pretty talented and uh, she wants to become a concert pianist. <laughs> I was 11 at the time. And, you know, for whatever reason, like the angels were at work, but Abby Simon said, well, here's my card. If you guys are ever in the Houston area, bring her over and have her play for me. <laughs> you know, just random. So fast forward a year or, you know, maybe not even a year. Um, we took him up on his offer. Uh, we found out that, wow, this guy's actually kind of famous. My parents realized he was famous because he was on an ad for Baldwin Pianos in the Texas Monthly, and his name was listed with Dave Brubeck. My parents didn't know classical musicians. There were other really illustrious classical names, but Dave Brubeck was the one, so they're like, if he's in the list with Dave Brubeck, he's gotta be legit. So they, uh, they drove me to Houston. I was, you know, completely shocked. You know, Houston was the big city, and, uh, Played for Abby Simon at University of Houston. Literally an hour later, he's on the phone with his good friend, Mary Norris. They were classmates at Curtis Institute. He called Mary Norris. He said, you got to hear this girl. My parents drove me to her house. She got on the phone. She called George Ballette, who was also a classmate of theirs at Curtis. And she said, you got to hear this girl. I think maybe she needs to come to Curtis Institute. Um, luckily, I didn't go to Curtis Institute. George Bullett came the next week to play with Houston Symphony, and my parents drove me down again. I played for him. He invited me to Curtis. I did go to Curtis um, about a year later for an audition, and I was completely freaked out. I mean, it was too much too soon. And uh, luckily I did stay in Texas and my entire, for six years, all through junior high and high school, my parents drove me 200 miles one way every Saturday. I was reminded when Erica was talking about her trip from Vermont to preschool, Juilliard, it was similar for us. We drove for piano lessons and I would alternate with Mary Norris and Abby Simon. And that's how I spent my high school years of of study going to Houston and then adding in the summertime um, with Mary Norris at Aspen Music Festival. Unbelievable. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> I admire your parents. I mean, it's yeah. you know, without the music education in their background, it takes quite a bit of understanding that they needed to do that for you, which is I, it's, it's, a, it's really, you know, it's amazing that my parents had something inside them that knew they had something special and they needed to foster this. And they, they literally dedicated, you know, their, Amazing. their lives. Yeah. And so you came, uh, fast forward, you came to Juilliard where you did your bachelor's and master's. Yes. So tell us about your, your six, was it six years? Yes. So, um, I actually took a little two year break in between 
bachelor's and master's because I needed to, I needed a break from Juilliard. So my bachelor's degree was um, studying with Abby Simon. Um, and that was fabulous. Um, you know, I landed from Texas, small East Texas town to New York City. And uh, as uh, Oksana said, the minute I landed in New York City, I was like, I'm home. <laughs> I was so excited and so raring to go and finally felt like I was amongst people like me. Um, and uh, it was exciting. And, you know, I quickly realized I was no longer um, a big fish in a small pond. I was a little tiny fish in a very big pond of New York City and Juilliard and, you know, around the best of the best, including yourself, Vera. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it was incredible. I mean, it was hard. It was, you know, we were at the practice rooms as soon as they opened, sometimes before, you know, if we knew the guard, we could get led into the Juilliard building and practice early and stayed late at night. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I, during my bachelor's degree, I, I, uh, oh, at the end of my bachelor's degree, I, I was able to go to Marlboro that summer. And so that was amazing. We have some good pictures. Yeah. yeah. Please show pictures of Paige in her youth and, uh, college years. And you can talk along. Okay. They come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this, I have no idea. This is like, I was, you know, being sullen and sassy and, you know, who do you think you are taking the picture? I don't know who took that picture. <laughs> that was my dorm room. Okay. This is, this is after, this was 94. I think this is a uh, Fleischer in Tanglewood. I spent two summers in Tanglewood. So two of the best summers of my life. And um, to my right is the great, composer and conductor Reinbert de Leo, we had just performed Schum, uh, Schoenberg Pierrot Lunaire, mm. which was just completely transformative for me. Mm. Beautiful. Next. Yes. So this is in Marlboro and to my, uh, well, to your right is um, Louis Bage and his wife and his son. And then my, at the time, my husband, I married very young, uh, that's Toby Hoffman, the great violist, but Louis Bage and I had just performed um, the Brahms Liebeslieder-Walze with four phenomenal singers, and uh, that was a highlight in my career to perform with him in Marlboro. He's legendary Marlboro pianist and teacher and, and he was there for generations. Uh, yes, you right? know, with the founding members, Rudolf Sturck. And, and and this is a nice segue because it was at that performance afterwards that Peter Sirkin was there at that concert. And um, these were the years right after his father, Rudolf Sirkin had died. So this was 1992 and um, that summer, Peter had come to play the choral fantasy because up until then, it was every summer Rudolf Serkin played the choral fantasy in Marlboro with the musicians of Marlboro and and pianist and other people. We were in the chorus. So that summer, I got to sing in the chorus of Beethoven choral fantasy with Peter Serkin at the piano. It was the first time it had been performed since Rudolf Serkin had died. And after this performance of Brahms, Peter Serkin came backstage and <laughs> gave me the greatest compliment of my entire life. He said, I have to tell you that I enjoyed this performance more than when my father played Brahms Liebeslieder with Luis. And at that day, we struck up a friendship and I wasn't in school at the time. I had just graduated and wasn't sure what I was going to do. And uh, I started studying that autumn with Peter Serkin privately. And then I went back to Juilliard to do my master's with Peter Serkin as my teacher. Great. Can we continue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is barge music where I performed a lot. Um, I'm not even sure this may have just been a photo op. I don't know if this is live because those are two violinists and I would have played piano quartet then, which should have been, well, maybe the guy Philippe was playing viola. Oh no, Toby's playing viola. So Toby Hoffman, Philippe Graffin, Per Inic, and me, you know, maybe 1995 at the Barge Music under the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. 
is my Juilliard uh, graduating recital, um, my bachelor's graduating recital. Great. Ah, that was also at the barge after a performance. Always a poignant photograph with the Twin Towers behind. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. This was a party after, after Kissin had played his Carnegie Hall recital. Uh, we went to a dinner afterwards. I was lucky to be friends with him in New York. Yeah. He, he would sight read um, on my piano. He would sight read chamber music, but he would play all the parts on the piano. <laughs> Not Once surprised. he sight read the uh, the Mozart the Kegelstadt trio, and of course the clarinet is not even you know in a regular clef, and he looked at it and it, and basically the whole thing came out on the piano. You know, complete genius. <laughs> yep, I believe it. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. And so, yeah. So you uh, tell us a little bit about your partnership with uh, Twila Tharp. Oh well. Uh, um, Twilight, yes. So um, I don't, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but somebody recommended me to her. Um, she was doing a Beethoven project. She's a wonderful choreographer, a ballet choreographer, and um, in the late '90s, she became obsessed with late Beethoven, mm. and uh, and and specifically Beethoven piano works. And so I had spent a lot of time with Beethoven, certainly um, my years with Peter Serkin and the whole kind of Marlboro influence. I was heavily uh, into German music at this point, um, Beethoven, Brahms, and someone recommended me and she asked me if I would uh, be willing to learn the Beethoven Diabelli variations. And uh, I jumped at it. And so we, uh, she, she created a ballet around the Diabelli variations and I got to perform those in Palermo and um, University of Iowa and London. And uh, it was a phenomenal experience to work side by side with dancers and choreography and have this kind of mixed media of experience. It, it was very, um, it changed my my way of approaching music after that. Um, it was wonderful. And we also did uh, the Hammerklavier, the Beethoven Hammerklavier Sonata um, a couple years later um, with another group that she mm -hmm. choreographed for Duke University and a few other places. It was, it was a great experience. Uh, tell us a little bit about Maurizio Paulini. <laughs> well, so my, uh, he's my ex-husband now, but my, husband at the time, Toby Hoffman, was playing regularly with Polini in Italy. And uh, I got to go and, and meet Polini there in Milano. And um, during those years that um, Toby was, they were performing chamber music. Um, they played at La Scala. They played everywhere in Italy. Uh, every time I would go, I would have a lesson with him. It was a kind of, you know, side perk of being the wife of one of the chamber players with Polini. But um, that was also, I mean, you know, talk about amazing for studying Beethoven sonatas and uh, Chopin sonata and Chopin ballade. Actually, the, the fourth ballade that Oksana, we heard her play. Um, that was an incredible experience with Polini. He's very cerebral. You know, his English is, he speaks great English, but, you know, he's a man of little words and um, it was intense. And, uh, you know, I, he's one of my absolute favorite pianists. So to just be in the same room with him was an inspiration. Sounds amazing. And it kind was. of how I imagine he would be a man of a few words. Yeah. Imagine yeah. Being that way. Great. And so you did mention to me that you took a long break from playing at some point. So tell us, tell us how did how did this come about? And well, um, you know, like maybe many performers, I I had been doing this since I was a child. I mean, my entire life was centered around the piano, and uh, much 
like Erica mentioned, she, she went skiing and she uh, wanted to do, she thought it occurred to her, maybe you can do something besides play piano. Um, I, I got to a point where I wanted to experience other things in life that I felt like, you know, I, it's either all or nothing for me. I'm very black and white. There's not much gray area. And I felt like I needed to find a little gray area just for my, uh, my growth as a human being. And, you know, I wanted to ski. I never got to do those things growing up because, you know, God forbid we break our thumb, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and by the way, a side note, um, that's the most, one of the most common ski injuries is that thumb, uh, dislocation and break. But the second most common is an ACL blow, which I did two years ago. So <laughs> I've had a horrific knee injury from skiing. Luckily, nothing with my hands, but you know, I wanted to experience those things. I, I, I got, I got remarried and I wanted to have children, which I, I did. My two girls are teenagers. Now I wanted to experience motherhood. I wanted to be all in with that. Um, I felt, I felt frankly kind of burnt out of the whole New York music scene, you know, scrapping it together, um, trying to make it, you know, all the, the stress of performing, um, the make or break aspect of it. And so I left New York in 2005. Um, at the time I was pregnant with my second child and my first child was, uh, she was about 16 months at the time. And I moved to Seattle because my uh, then has husband, I have been divorced twice now. <laughs> uh, my then husband oh, is from you. Seattle yeah. <laughs> and we started a life here and I just decided to jump headfirst into being a mommy. <laughs> and I, I took off from playing. I did a little teaching on the side, but really I left music behind for the most part. Um, I really didn't touch it mm -hmm. uh, for for almost 10 years. Like I, I, I mean, I would, you know, if I was teaching, I had to show the little children, you know, the keys or whatnot, but I didn't practice mm -hmm. for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and then, can yeah. Can you show you know, some pictures, please? You go ahead, Paige. Talk talk along. Oh, that's just that's just uh, a current picture. That was actually after I got a new haircut. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so what happened? Yeah. So here, this this picture is after um, this last summer a performance, um, albeit uh, a virtual performance because none of us has been back um, in the concert hall yet. Well, some people are, but we haven't. This was after a uh, Seattle Chamber Music Society. So I, um, I went to Juilliard with James Ennis, uh, who is the current art artistic director of Seattle Chamber Music Society. And uh, I guess about six years ago, I went to one of their concerts. Some of my old friends and colleagues were in town playing chamber music, and I just decided I'm gonna go hear a concert and uh, I really hadn't even been going to concerts. Um, and I went backstage and I said hello to him and he said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I live here now. And he said, are you kidding? I said, no, I live here. I have my children and you know, my life is here now. And I, for whatever reason, I just decided maybe it was time to put a little ember, a little something out there. And I sent him an email and I said, hey, you know, I'm local. If you're ever in need of a pianist out here for the festival in whatever capacity, um, I think I'm going to start practicing again. <laughs> and the next uh, few months, I got an email from him and he invited me to, to play at the Chamber Music Society. And that was, yes, here I am with a fantastic violinist, Simone Porter. We had just played Janacek violin sonata, violin and piano sonata. And uh, so, so now I've come back to it in, in a much smaller uh, way um, without the same kind of ambition, but in a way that suits me very well because I, I play kind of when and how and what I want to play. And uh, it's, it's, there's much less stress involved for me because I have my other life 
with my children and all the other things that I like to do. And piano is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And so I feel very uh, fulfilled now um, with all aspects of my life. And here's my, my one of my dearest friends, Yafin Brofman, <laughs> after he had played here with the Seattle Symphony pre-COVID. Um, I've known Yafin Bronfman since I met him in Aspen in 1984, when I was just a kid and he was kind of a kid then too. But uh, I've, FEMA and I, I've played a lot for him. I would go and play things for him when I was preparing for recitals and concerts and go run through things with him. He, he played a lot of concerti with me when I was getting ready to play with orchestra, he'd play the piano part. So FEMA is a wonderful old friend and one of the greatest pianists out there, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, this was after a, a children's concert for Chamber Music Society. So one of my students had presented me with that beautiful bouquet. So these are, are my students, also pre-COVID. I, I, I generally keep about 10 students in my studio at a time. And this was after one of the, my studio recitals, all my little munchkin, adorable students. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, it's a very naughty cat at one of my students' houses that didn't want to let us have any kind of concentration at all because I'm a sucker for naughty cats, <laughs> including my own. Vera, I, you have pulled up some very funny photographs here. <laughs> it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a family concert for Chamber Music Society. We had just done a, a hilarious PDQ Bach piece. The, the boy on the far right of your screen, that's a wig he was wearing. He was the narrator. He's a drama student at the time at NYU, one of my neighbors that I got to uh, narrate this really, really, you can imagine, funny PDQ Bach mm. work. Yeah. Uh, this was one of the great nights at Seattle Chamber Music Society. I, I played uh, Mushkovsky Suite with Augusta Hadlick and James Ennis. That was a highlight. Yeah. Another piano student. Recital, uh, Karen Gomio there. Um, we had played a benefit for Seattle Chamber Music Society, a recital there. It was amazing. She's one of my favorite violinists. And then this is an old friend of mine, Derek Bermel, who's just a phenomenal composer. Um, I think he runs uh, Copeland House now, which is in Brooklyn and uh, known him for a long, long time, played quite a bit of his music. Again, FEMA, Yafim Bronfman. <laughs> it's so great when people come to Seattle to perform with the orchestra, because then I get to see a lot of old friends. Is This was on the top of the Empire State Building. A guy who was doing some uh, professional shots for me, we decided to just have some fun, fun photographs too. Uh, this was in Carnegie Hall. This was, uh, I was already living in Seattle and I flew to Carnegie Hall to hear Maurizio Pellini play an all Chopin recital. So I do fly to New York and other places to listen to concerts that are especially meaningful to me. I'll, I'll fly anywhere to hear Pellini play. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, being a cancer survivor? Oh yes, you showed one of the photographs I had used the little, uh, whatever you call it on Facebook that says I'm a survivor. Yes, in, in uh, 2007, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and my children at the time were one year old and three years old. Um, I was 37 and my grandmother, the pianist that you showed some photographs of her, she, um, she actually died of breast cancer um, even though she had some remission, it came back years later and, and took over her. So, um, yeah, I spent about a year and a half, um, having a lot of surgeries, um, treatment. I 
had unfortunately a mastectomy and reconstruction. And um, it was, you know, it was again, I look at some of these things as, as opportunities to look at life through a different lens and appreciate what's in front of me. And, um, you know, my family were all incredibly supportive. And um, luckily, I've had, you know, no, no illness cancer wise since then. Um, it's many, many years in remission. Um, but it's certainly given me an appreciation for all the beauty that life has to offer music, my children, skiing when we're not crashing and getting injured and uh, getting to know people like you, even through this crazy COVID world of, of virtual. I mean, it's also presented opportunities that, you know, they're new and exciting. And I, I've met people that I would never have met otherwise, just like this situation. Very true. Uh, to close our broadcast, we wanted to play pages, uh, another video that we have of her performing Mozart Sonata with violinist. And you can tell us who it is. Oh, yes, this is Simon James, a fabulous violinist here. Um, he's on faculty at San Francisco Conservatory. And this is just recent. This was a, um, a performance we put together for San Francisco Conservatory of Music. So we played a whole program. This was one of the pieces we played.
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Paige. It was such an honor to have you guys join our broadcast. I've learned so much. I feel like I, you know, I've gained new friends really, uh, you know, in the last two hours. Thank you so much for being part of our broadcast today and sharing your story. We truly appreciate it. And uh, we hope that you uh, felt good about contributing uh, because I think sharing stories is really very important to everybody's listening because they, they do learn a lot about what it's like to be a musician and be in the music industry. So thank you so much all. Thank you to our listeners. And we hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. Take care, so long.